It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. This morning, the Premier received a letter from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce urging the government not to proceed with their scheme to rip up the contract with the beer store. They're joining the Ontario Chamber of Commerce and thousands and thousands of Ontarians who are raising serious concerns about this reckless scheme. Does the minister still believe it's a good idea? The question is to the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you for the question. You know, it's interesting to note that most people in the province of Ontario uh, were the same as uh, I was when I first got elected. They don't know, we don't realize, the, the beer store is not owned by the government of Ontario. Yes, we own the LCBO, but the uh, beer store is owned by three global beer giants. They were given a sweetheart deal by the Liberal government who put people ahead of profits. The deal is terrible for the consumers, it is killing competition, it is keeping prices high, and it is stifling our craft brewers. There is no deal like this anywhere else in the world. It is a sweetheart deal that rewards only the beer store and their near monopoly. We would have to open 11,500 new outlets, Speaker, just to be at the same level per capita as the province of Quebec. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce certainly knows who owns the beer store. You know, the minister and the Order. premier spent a lot of public money jetting to New York and Washington, but evidently uh, they never checked in with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Like the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, they are raising serious concerns about a government that rips up contracts on a whim. Now, we know the previous government did that, and now we have gov a government in place that's doing the exact same things. And Ontario families are wondering why the government is ready to blow hundreds of millions of dollars on this beer store scheme, uh, in fact, this beer store battle, Order. when that money could so much better be invested in things like education and health care. Why is the finance minister so committed to this reckless and senseless scheme? Minister Finance. <clears throat> Speaker, we campaigned on a promise to put people first, including by growing jobs and expanding choice and convenience for Ontario consumers. Order. Our government's open for business and open for jobs, and that approach is working. Since coming to office, 170,000 net new jobs have been created across the province. Just last week, we heard from Fitch Bond Rating Agency, who gave us an upgrade, the first upgrade in eight years. Wow. Uh, eight years, Speaker, and they did this after we brought our legislation with the beer store. The fact of the matter is that it's a bad deal for consumers and a bad deal for businesses. Special Advisor Ken Hughes says the agreement with the beer store, and I quote, stifled competition keeps prices artificially high and prevents new craft beer entrepreneurs from getting a strong foothold in the market, quote. Speaker, we will always get the best deal possible Fonts. for Ontario consumers and Ontario businesses. The final supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the people of Ontario have been pretty clear. They want a government that's focused on priorities like schools and hospitals. Instead, they have a government that's ready to blow billions of dollars, potentially, on a beer store battle, a scheme so reckless it's becoming an international incident now. Will this minister back away from this reckless plan today? Please take your seat. Minister to respond. Speaker, repeating uh, beer store insider made up numbers is not going to advance this uh, cause. Nowhere else in the world does a government give the biggest beer store companies special privileges at the expense of consumers and the rest of the industry? The three global beer giants are for profits, not for the people. You have to ask yourself, Speaker, why are these multinational companies fighting the province so hard when all we want to do is put more of their product in more stores? The, the, the reason, Speaker, is because their deal was so lucrative. The sweetheart deal that 
they made with the previous Liberal government is so lucrative they will do anything, say anything to make sure they keep their turf. They're ignoring the economic opportunity that we know. Expanding beer and wine into corner stores and grocery stores and big box stores will add 9,100 jobs to the province of Ontario and $3.5 billion in our economy. Why don't you repeat those numbers? The next question. Once again, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next uh, question is for the Minister of Health. Yesterday, London Health Sciences announced that they would be cutting an equivalent of 165 full time positions due to budget challenges. Can the Minister explain how eliminating 165 frontline health care workers is going to eliminate hallway medicine? Question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, London Health Sciences has experienced some difficulties in the past. But certainly our government is helping all hospitals across Ontario with an additional $1.3 billion into our health care system with this year's budget, $384 million in new money for operational expenses, and a $1.2 million investment for London Health Sciences Centre in last fall to help them get prepared for the flu season. However, they make their own decisions. They have their own independent board of directors. But as part of this exercise, London Health Sciences Centre is exploring opportunities to not fill vacant, non-patient-facing roles and is also reviewing parameters to mitigate overtime hours. There are no job cuts or reductions being contemplated at this time. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the hospital CEO in London was pretty clear yesterday, and I quote, it's been very tough to operate in this environment, to operate where expenses are inflationary and revenue is flat. And the Financial Accountability Office, of course, was clear that we're going to see more and more cuts as hospital funding falls behind inflation. It was a recipe for hallway medicine under the Liberals as they played the game the same way, and it's a recipe for hallway medicine now as this government hasn't learned from the mistakes of the Liberal government. 165 health professionals are losing jobs in London. Is the government prepared to acknowledge that their scheme to end hallway medicine is simply not working because it's fundamentally the same scheme that the Liberals had in place? The member for Don Valley East will come to order. Minister of Finance will come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. The member for Mississauga Streetsville will come to order. Start the clock. Minister to reply. Thank you. Uh, well, in fact, Mr. Speaker, I will say to the Leader of the Official Opposition to you that, in actual fact, we are increasing the amount of money that we are putting into health care, $1.3 billion this year. We promised the people of Ontario during last year's election campaign that we would protect what matters most to them, health care and education. We're increasing our education. Uh, Budget as well, and as well as health care. $1.3 billion is a lot of money. $384 million to increase the operational costs in hospitals is a lot of money. We are working with London Health Sciences Centre. There has been an update from yesterday, I'm happy to say, and that we, uh, we know that London Health Sciences Centre is taking steps to mitigate their budgetary challenges and is undertaking a review to generate cost savings. And as Bonds? I indicated in the previous response, they are also exploring active opportunities to not fill vacant, non-patient-facing roles and are not contemplating any job cuts. Thank you. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, for families that are worried about the state of Ontario's health care and the next trip to the emergency room, the Ford government cuts are deeply, deeply concerning. <clears throat> cuts to public health, cuts to ambulance services, cuts to cancer screening, and now eliminating frontline health staff at hospitals. Speaker, these are the things that matter most to the people of Ontario. Is this what the Ford government uh, is uh, planning on doing uh, for the next three years to our health care system? We don't want to see what that's going to look like, Speaker. Is the minister ready to admit that her budget cuts are 
causing frontline staff to be laid off, impacting care for the patients of our province as a result? And will she leave more patients waiting for care in hospital hallways by continuing with this wrong-headed move? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, her reply. Well, thank you, Speaker. I guess I need to say it again. We are increasing our investments into our health care budget by $1.3 billion this year. And as in addition to that, what we're doing is modernizing our system. It's not responding to the needs of Ontarians. It's not fulfilling their requirements. It's not going to be sustainable for the future. And the people of Ontario know that if we want to have a health care system, if we want to have an education system in the future, we need to make some changes, and we need to make them, those changes right now. And what we are doing is making sure that we will be responding to the needs of Ontarians now and into the future. We want to make sure that they receive the connected care that they deserve, which they're not receiving right now. Right now, once they, people leave hospital and they need home care, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know who's going to be coming, when they're coming, what care they're going to be providing. That is not excellent quality health care. That's what we are changing. That's what we're working on in hospitals and health facilities across this province. So it will be sustainable for the future and it will provide. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment. I didn't hear what was said, but I'm going to ask the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, to stand up and withdraw. Withdraw. Recognize again the Leader of the Opposition. I'll give you a Speaker, I appreciate that. Uh, as I said, my question is to the Minister of the Environment. While the Ford government spends millions of public dollars fear-mongering about the dangers of fighting the climate crisis, a new study by Canadians for Clean Prosperity, a business-oriented environmental group, shows that the Ford government's inadequate carbon reduction schemes will actually cost Ontario businesses far more than an effective one would, and add as much as $154 a year to household budgets. Will the minister be revising his sticker campaign to warn households of the ineffectiveness of and the expense associated with the Ford government carbon scheme? Here, here, here. Question is to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, and through you to the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the fact that the carbon tax lobby group is saying that a carbon tax is a good thing shouldn't be a surprise even to the NDP. Mr. Speaker, the FAO confirmed that $648 is the amount that it will cost Ontario families in 2022. In fact, the report she's referencing actually agrees with those numbers. It suggests that the difference between our plan and the Liberal plan is $550, pretty close to that $648, wouldn't you say, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I think the Leader of the Opposition will be more concerned about the effects of carbon tax, for example, in Hamilton. So when I see that Hamilton Health Science Centre and the St. Joseph's Healthcare Centre are going to together be paying close to $3 million in additional tax to Justin Trudeau, I would think the Leader of the Opposition would be worried about what's happening at home in Hamilton. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we will keep talking about our plan to reduce greenhouse gases. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the simple fact is when it comes to the climate emergency that we, were, that we are all facing, the cost of action is nothing compared to the cost of inaction, and Hamiltonians know that very, very well. In fact, the city of Hamilton has declared a climate crisis, Speaker. Perhaps this government should do the same. This spring, it's been more clear than ever that Ontario needs to act, yet the Ford government is moving absolutely in the wrong direction, cutting funding to treat replanting and conservation efforts, even while they spend millions forcing every Ontario gas station to post partisan uh, advertising. Is the Ford government ready, Speaker, to concede that their scheme will not only cost families more, but utterly fail to address the growing danger of the climate emergency that all of us are facing? Members, please take your seats. 
Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks to respond. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. Uh, again, when we got rid of Kathleen Wynne's cap and trade program, a program that I know this uh, this opposition party supported, Mr. it was $264 in the pockets of Ontarians. Justin Trudeau's program is going to take $648 out of the pockets, and that doesn't even include, Mr. Speaker, the impacts on McMaster University. Mr. Speaker, a very important institution, again in the great great city of Hamilton. $1.3 million, Mr. Speaker. $1.3 million of impact in Hamilton, where the leader of the opposition is from. We will keep telling Ontarians about these programs. We will keep telling Ontarians about the impact on families. No, we're not going to step away from fighting the carbon tax, and we're not going to step away from fighting climate change. You can fight climate change without a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for question the Minister here. of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Last week, the minister travelled to Halifax to promote our Open for Business, Open for Jobs mandate at the Committee on Internal Trade. And as a former international trade lawyer, I understand the importance of interprovincial trade as a key economic driver in Ontario. Interprovincial trade supports agriculture, farmers, small businesses, and good jobs in my riding of Carleton and across Ontario. And in 2017 alone, Ontario exported approximately $145 billion in goods and services to other Canadian jurisdictions. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please outline how he has been working hard to reduce interprovincial trade barriers and promote the importance of free trade between provinces and territories? That is, that is exactly the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thanks to the member from Carleton for the great question and the great work that she's doing in her riding and here at the Legislature. I had a productive trip to Halifax last week, Mr. Speaker. It's always great to get back to the Maritimes. Uh -huh. The Committee on Internal Trade was meeting there. That's the body that governs the CFTA, the Canada Free Trade Agreement, Speaker, which was meant to get rid of internal trade barriers. It's something that Ontario is a leader on, Mr. Speaker, and despite the, the agreement being in force since 2017, progress is just too slow, Speaker. Uh, trade barriers between provinces and territories are holding back job creators in Ontario, and they're holding back job creators in Canada, quite honestly. Uh, the Bank of Montreal estimates that eliminating these barriers would add 15 to 20 billion dollars a year to Ontario's GDP, and that's why this is such an important priority for Premier Ford and our government. Speaker, we Response. can create thousands of jobs by tearing down these barriers, and that's why Ontario is going to continue to push for freer trade with Canada's provinces and territories. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you, thank you to the minister for his excellent response. Interprovincial trade is an important issue for the hardworking people of Carleton and across Ontario. And I know that I speak on behalf of our side of the House when I say that I am relieved that reducing interprovincial trade barriers is one of the Minister's key priorities in his portfolio. Mr. Speaker, we came into office on a commitment to protect what matters most, and that includes creating and protecting good jobs. That means we need to push the federal government and other provinces on this issue. The agreement Ontario signed with Saskatchewan in the fall is one example of how we've already taken steps to reduce trade barriers right here in Ontario. And through you, Mr. Speaker, could the minister please expand on what other steps Ontario is taking to reduce interprovincial trade barriers? Great question. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. Since taking office in June of last year, we've been providing a lot of leadership on the interprovincial trade file. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, back in October, as the member just mentioned, Premier Ford and Premier Mo of Saskatchewan signed an MOU to cut red tape and reduce trade barriers between the two provinces. When I was in Halifax, I told my colleagues that we're committed to getting pipelines yeah, yeah. built, Mr. Speaker. That will add tremendous opportunity, not just in Ontario but to our country. In April, I wrote to my counterparts and told them Ontario. 
Ontario is giving up our veto of pipeline projects under the Canada Free Trade Agreement. A report from the Fraser Institute shows that Canadian oil producers lost almost $21 billion Mr. Speaker, last year because they can't get their oil to market. We don't want to get in the way of that, Speaker, in Ontario. We want to get out of the way so we can see that kind of growth in our GDP and in our economy. That's thousands of good jobs that we're missing out on, Speaker, here in Ontario and in Canada. And we're Spons. not going to sit idly by while that happens. Premier Ford has been a leader on the uh, Canadian front, and we are going to strive for a Canada free trade agreement that works for all provinces. Hey, hey. Thank you. The next question, member for University Rosedale. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. Yesterday, Metrolinx quietly cut five GO bus routes altogether and significantly reduced service on two more. These cuts mean that commuters in Oakville, Milton, Bolton and North York will have to cram onto overcrowded GO buses and face even longer travel times. Mr Speaker, how can the minister expect Ontarians to believe he is committed to improving our commutes when he scraps bus routes and reduces service when no one is looking? Questions to the Minister of Transportation. Thanks uh, very much. Uh for that question from the member opposite, and good morning. Uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, we uh, came to uh, government uh, just about uh, this Friday, be a year since we were elected and uh, sworn in the end of, uh, of June. And Mr. Speaker, we inherited a $15 billion deficit, uh, record debt. And what we've done over the last year, Mr. Speaker, is, is review line by line the spending within uh, the Ministry of Transportation. What we've done, Mr. Speaker, is uh, we have uh, focused on expanding GO Rail throughout this province. We've increased uh, service 25 per cent to Kitchener. We've first time ever have GO Rail going out to Niagara Falls and St. Catharines, Mr. Speaker, the largest expansion of service on the Lakeshore East and West. So, Mr. Speaker, Unfortunately, we've looked at what programs, what buses were running in this uh, system, Mr. Speaker, that were empty, Mr. Speaker, or barely Response. going, Mr. Speaker, and we've repositioned some of those bus routes to newer routes that have been ex ex uh, brought forward, Mr. Speaker, and we look forward to continuing growing our regional transportation network in the GTHA. The supplementary question. Uh, back to the minister. Uh, the estimates came out last month, and they showed that the government slashed $184 million from Metrolinx's budget. It is now clear that the minister's cuts to Metrolinx mean axing bus service that people rely on every day. These buses are not empty. Mr. Speaker, what additional service cuts and fare hikes does the minister have planned for our region's go riders? Again, the Minister of Transportation reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the member opposite needs to take a look at the successes that we've had over the last year on the go uh, transit system. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have uh, expanded service to Kitchener by 25 per cent. We've in created a new route to Niagara and St. Catharines and expanded the Lakeshore East and West routes. Mr. Speaker, we are positioning ourselves to continue to grow the GO network across the entire GTHA. Uh, just recently, we announced that kids under 12 get to ride GO Transit for free. That's a permanent structure. Mr. We are going to continue to integrate our fares in the system, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to work with our partners at CN and CP to expand uh, ridership. And just recently, with the Minister of Infrastructure, we released the RFP uh, that's going to work towards expanding GO Transit across the entire network. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, once this RFP is in place, Response. GO Rail will be self sufficient by 2031. That's a record we want to have in this government. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. The Premier continues to push a manufactured fiscal crisis in the name of finding efficiencies. Yet this government seems perfectly happy to spend government one billion of taxpayers' dollars on booze. It Stop the clock. The Minister for Children, Community and Social Services. Please come to order. Restart the clock. I apologize to the member for Scarborough Guildwood. 
Thank you, Speaker. The Premier continues to push a manufactured fiscal crisis in the name of finding efficiencies. Yet this government seems perfectly happy to spend $1 billion of taxpayers' dollars on booze in damages to beer stores, while at the same time cutting a billion side, dollars in order. social services over the next three years. The government's priorities are wrong-headed, forcing children with autism into oversized classrooms, spending more tax dollars on ineffective and regressive climate policies, axing the child advocate by hiring a special advisor for alcohol, and firing Question. the non-partisan partisan expert panel on ending violence against women. Speaker, when will this government be open for children with autism, open to real climate crisis solutions, and open to the general well-being for Ontarians, rather than corner store full— Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the member for Kitchener-Conestoga must come to order. The question is to the Deputy Premier, and I recognize the Deputy Premier. Refer to the Minister of Finance. Much, uh, where, where, where do you start with uh, all of those uh, uh, pieces uh, of which, Speaker, sadly, uh, very little of that uh, is even based on fact? Uh, we passed a budget, Speaker, that Order. is entitled protecting what matters most, and that is exactly what it does, Speaker. It protects health care, it protects education, and it protects the services that we rely on every day. You have to think, Speaker, coming from this member, this, this Liberal member who sat by and watched their government spend $40 million a day more than they took in. And that was fine then. That was fine for the Liberals to do. $40 million a day Order. more than they took in. We have been making smart, long-term decisions. We're reinventing the way government delivers services. We're focusing our resources Response. on the individuals and families in greatest need, and that is how we're restoring trust, transparency and accountability, and balancing the budget. Thank you very much. This supplementary question. Speaker. The reality is that this government is spending about $5 billion more than the Liberal government's previous budget. And somehow, we continue to see devastating cuts for the people, justified by sham consultations and little to no evidence-based decision-making. Government side, Why is this order. government set on leaving the people of Ontario behind through countless broken promises and skewed priorities? This government can't continue to pull the wool over Ontarians' eyes. The evidence is right in front of us. We cannot be fooled. The people are not pawns in, our poli in your political game. These are real lives that are at stake with real consequences. The families and the children with autism have been here day after day after day Question. looking for answers from this government. Well, when will this government finally put the people first, just like you claimed? And stop the clock again. <laughs> Interjections are out of order. So is yelling across the floor. The member for Kitchener-Conestoga must come to order. The member for Carleton must come to order. Start the clock. The Minister of Finance to reply. Much. Well, Speaker, again, where, where do you start with that? Last question, we're not spending enough. This question, we're spending too much. So why don't we just sort of get the facts straight, Speaker? Let me tell you what that member and, and, uh, and her party voted against, Speaker. They voted against bringing $26 billion of tax relief to Ontario families, seniors, individuals, students, and businesses. That's what that government or that's what that opposition voted against. Speaker, they voted against two billion dollars in low-income individual and family tax credits. They voted against two billion dollars in bringing child care to 300,000 low- and middle-income families. And yes, they too voted against bringing 90 million dollars to help 100,000 low-income seniors have free dental. That's what they're voting. We certainly know what they're against now, Response. Speaker. They're against protecting what matters most, Speaker. We will stay here and we will protect what matters most for the people. Stop the clock.
The member for Ottawa South must come to order. Restart the clock. The next question. The member for Markham Stouffville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Training, Colleges and University. Mr. Speaker, for 15 very long years, the previous Liberal government allowed the skilled trades to become complex, convoluted. In fact, their system kept people out of the skilled trades. Now, we know by 2021, some one in five will, jobs will be in the skilled trades. Now, these are very good jobs. These are important jobs helping build a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And I know in my riding, tradespeople are very excited by the opportunities that this government is putting forward. I know last week the minister made an announcement on this. I wonder if she might help uh, the House better understand the changes that she's uh, brought forward in the announcement that she made last week. Before I recognize the minister to respond, the member for Hamilton East Stony Creek has to come to order. Yes, he did. <laughs> the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member uh, for his question and his great work uh, on behalf of the people of, uh, I was going to say Perth Wellington, but Markham Stouffville. Uh, speaker, I would like to thank the Premier as well as uh, the member from uh, Northumberland, Peterborough South, and the MPP from, from Durham for joining me last Friday at the Darlington Energy Complex <laughs> to announce our plan to modernize the skilled trades in Ontario. Uh, through Budget 2019, we passed the Modernizing the Skilled Trades and Apprenticeship Act, which will reduce red tape for employers and apprentices, streamline service delivery, and help promote the vibrant and tremendous opportunities in the skilled trades in Ontario. Our plan includes the implementation of a portable skills model, which will allow training and certification within and between Response. the trades. This new flexible framework will allow our workforce to respond to the demands of the changing job market, ensuring that Ontario is open for business and open for jobs. Thank you. The member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, has to come to order. Supplementary question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, how disappointing it is to see the NDP yet again voting against and working against our tradespeople, whether it's craft brewers, whether it's small business people, and now the tradespeople, it, the NDP will always vote against those people who want to work hard, yeah. make a difference for the province of Ontario, and help build a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario. It is clear they're upset that our changes are seeing more people come Order. into the trades. They should be happy about that. We know what 15 years of Liberal governments created. They created a system where people couldn't get in, when I met with the tradespeople, they said it's partly responsible for the increasing house prices because there weren't enough tradespeople yeah. to do the jobs, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. So I wonder if the minister, despite the opposition that we're getting from the NDP, who don't seem to care about hard-working people in the province of Ontario, if the minister could continue and provide us more information on why this announcement is so good Question. for the province of Ontario. <laughs> minister of Training, and thank you again to the member for the question. The member is absolutely right that our government is taking decisive action to reduce the burden on Ontario's skilled tradespeople and develop a modern, skilled trade workforce. Speaker, as part of our plan to put our skilled tradespeople first, our government is investing $18.1 million in pre-apprenticeship programs to help prepare hardworking Ontarians for careers in the skilled trades. We are also investing $12.2 million to support the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program <laughs> to help students in grade 11 and 12 gain the experience they need in the skilled trades while getting credits for school. <laughs> Speaker, by investing in the jobs of today and tomorrow, our government is delivering Response. on our promise to get Ontarians working and make Ontario open for business and open for jobs. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you. Creek has to come to order. The member for Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. The member for Markham Stouffville will come to order. The member for Markham Stouffville is warned.
The member for Sudbury can now ask his question. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, the member from Solville actually talked about New Democrats not caring about workers. A good opportunity for the government to, to uh, demonstrate that they do. The questions for the minister. Okay, stop the clock. I, he, he's going to ask his question to the government. He's going to say who it is. Don't start yelling at him, just as he's got the floor. Order. Start the clock. The member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. I apologize for the behavior. My question is for the Minister of Labour. The member opposite said the New Democrats can't demonstrate they care about workers. This question is about that. It's an opportunity for the minister to demonstrate her care as well. Uh, speaker, as reported by the Toronto Star, three temporary agency workers died working for Ferrera Foods or its Great. affiliated plants over a 17-year span. And only after pressure and, da pressure and damning media reports did the previous Liberal government launch an inspection of the industrial bakery. And following those inspections, another worker, a 52-year-old temp worker, died in a related Ferrera business that was not part of the previous inspections. It's clear there's a pattern of incidents leading to the deaths of Fiera Foods and its affiliates, but the Ministry of Labour has failed to investigate them properly. Will the Minister of Labour commit today to ordering proactive workplace safety inspections of all Fiera Food affiliates? Question. The question is to the Minister of Labour. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. Um, workplace deaths are a tragedy. And we, on this side, and as Ministry of Labour, not willing to compromise on protecting workers through health and safety uh, enforcement. We're increasing Order. actually enforcement budget by half a million dollars, Mr. Speaker. We are helping more workers become safer by making health and safety training more accessible more convenient and less expensive. We've made health and safety training courses available online as a way to supplement in-person training. Mr. Speaker, we're modernizing government services across the board by making more information and services available online. We, Response. Mr. Speaker, in respect, are actually increasing the number of health and safety inspectors throughout the province so that we can watch uh, where workplace. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I would argue perhaps that reducing the number of hours of workplace training from three full days in person class to six and a half hours online is not improving safety. I asked the Minister the question because since the fourth death of a temporary worker at Fiera Businesses, the government has signaled to large employers such as Fiera that health and safety conditions will largely be self-reported. It also signals to temp workers that they have it too good and they don't need specific protections. In fact, since the death of the fourth temporary worker at Fiera Businesses, Speaker, this government has cut at least $16 million from programs meant to prevent workplace injuries and deaths. I'll ask again, will the Minister of Labour commit today to standing up for workers, ordering proactive workplace safety inspections at all Fiera Food affiliates. Thank you. Again, the Minister of Labour to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite should know that I cannot comment directly on investigations that are occurring through the Ministry of Labour. But I can tell the member opposite that health and safety enforcement is not a nice to have, it's an essential for this government, and we are protecting health and safety. Mr. Speaker, we've increased enforcement budget by half a million dollars. We're proud of the fact that we prioritize health and safety inspections and enforcements, Mr. Speaker. Opposition there are come to order. Investigations that go on proactively and preventatively, Mr. Speaker. I know that this side of the House and I, as Minister of Labour, are keeping workers safe, and that's what we owe them, and that's what we're continuing to do, Mr. Speaker, by modernizing the Ministry of Labour. So that more people begin to be educated. And Mr. Speaker, again, I will say for the third time in this uh, question period, Response. that we've increased the enforcement officers for health and safety. The next question. 
Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. Question, question for the Minister of uh, Infrastructure. And uh, we received news uh, a few weeks ago when the Minister and the Minister of Agriculture uh, arrived in my riding to unveil a key piece of Ontario's budget commitment to improve people's broadband connections, no matter where they live. Uh, for years, I've been hearing from people in my area complaining. I hear these complaints in my own home, actually, about poor internet service. And this is going to help. It's going to help families stay connected. It's going to help students with their homework. It's going to help both large and small businesses be part of Ontario's thriving economy. Minister, could you let people in this House uh, give them an idea what the SWIFT program is about and what are the next steps for this program to uh, see some progress down in Norfolk County? Questions to the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, and thank you uh, to the member from Haldeman Norfolk for that uh, excellent question. Mr. Speaker, without a doubt, being disconnected means being disadvantaged. I was happy to join the member, along with my colleague, the Minister of uh, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, for this very exciting announcement. Mr. Speaker, our government is committing up to $63.7 million to the SWIFT program. We've heard from our rural and northern communities and unlike the previous Liberal government, we're taking action. SWIFT offers reliable broadband access, allowing residents and businesses to stream high-speed internet from their homes, farms, and businesses. People will access digital services, get their work done, and connect with their loved ones. Mr. Speaker, affordable broadband connectivity is essential in rural and northern Response. Ontario. With this commitment, we're providing that we're putting the people, or we're proving that we're putting the people at the center of everything we do and protecting what matters most. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Minister. And I will add the other half of my riding. Uh, Haldeman <laughs> County uh, does not opt into the uh, SWIFT program, and they also have some considerable issues with connection. Again, uh, however, this is great news for farmers. Um, Farmers can't remain compliant and, com and competitive when they can't effectively do business online or file documents. Modern agriculture requires connectivity for a variety of jobs, checking the weather, checking the markets. Affordable broadband is essential across rural Ontario uh, to access e-commerce, close deals, process payments, share information, connect with your customers and with your markets. Speaker, could the minister reiterate why broadband is so important for the business of farming? Minister. Uh, I'll refer this to the minister, uh, minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. To the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thanks to the member from Haldeman Norfolk for that uh, very great question. Our farmers know that access to reliable internet is critical for their business to thrive. Agriculture is increasingly high-tech with the rise of precision agriculture. As farming becomes increasingly high land and labor intensive, technology also needs to be far more controlled and accurate in the systems like GPS guidance, sensors, robotics, drones, autonomous vehicles like tractors, and many more. Farmers and those in rural parts of the province have access to even fewer resources due to the nature of their remote locations. So their need to access wider government resources such as health care and especially mental health care options online is even more urgent. I'm proud of our government's investment to expand Response. broadband in southwestern Ontario through the SWIFT and in eastern Ontario through ECORN. And we look forward to continuing this important work to make sure that those in rural Ontario have the same access. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, today, the Globe and Mail uncovered the Premier's latest scheme to play mayor of Toronto. Uh, the Premier and his minister will be unilaterally making changes to the City of Toronto's official plan that would, and I quote, loosen the rules it would have imposed on developers in order to increase flexibility and reduce red tape for businesses, end quote. The city will have no ability to appeal these decisions, and the people of Toronto uh, will have no ability to make their voices heard uh, on these changes. Mr. Speaker, the 
Premier is once again making changes that will have a significant impact on the people of Toronto without any consultation. So my question is simple. Why? Questions to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, uh, Speaker, through you to the Honourable Member, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, last June, we, uh, we had an election, and uh, those two official plan amendments, uh, 405 and 406, were presented to the Ministry. Those uh, didn't reflect our government's priorities. And we made it very clear, and we continue to make it clear, that we need to build more housing. So, with all due respect to the member opposite, you know, direct your, direct your comments not to the Premier but to me. The files were sent to me, and it's my intention to provide modifications uh, to uh, OPA 405 and 406 to reflect government priorities. In terms of consultation, we've had robust consultation, Speaker, through you to the honourable member. Our housing supply action plan, Bill 108, that's being presently debated at third reading, makes it very clear that we are going to increase the housing supply, a place to grow. The growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe had extensive consultation last fall and this spring, again, Response. unanimously. We indicated that we would be intensifying around major transit station exactly. areas. There's been lots of consultation. Now we're working into implementation, Speaker. Supplementary question. Back to the minister. This is hardly the first time that this premier has made sweeping changes that affect the daily lives of the people of Toronto. The government has stolen the subway system away from the people of Toronto. They threw order. Order. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. Complete your question. Thank you, Speaker. They threw Toronto's democracy into chaos with their unilateral changes to Toronto City Council in the middle of an election, and their cuts to everything from public health to education will make the lives of people in the City of Toronto so much harder. How can the minister justify running roughshod over the people of Toronto once again? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing again. I can justify the why. We need to leverage the $28.5 billion that our government is spending on transit. You look at those two official plan amendments. 90% of the transit and the LRT is in that area. We have to intensify around major transit station areas. And again, the member keeps talking about the Premier. It is my intention as Minister of Municipal Affairs to present those modifications later today to uh, the city. And again, we are trying to move forward on things that I would think that this member would support. We are going to continue to work on inclusionary zoning so that we can have affordable housing near transit. But make no mistake, when we had those consultations on housing supply action plan, when we had the consultations on, the, on a place to grow, uh, the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, almost Response. unanimously, we talked about intensifying around major transit station exactly. areas. This is what we're going to do for the people, those people that are dreaming. Uh, to realize the dream of home ownership, we have to. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Markham, Union. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for Minister of Infrastructure. This week, he joined the Minister of Transportation for an excellent announcement. Our government ran on a mandate to make Ontario open for business and to get the province moving. Commuters have spent years frustrated with overcrowding on Yang Line, and they want more connections across the region. With the upload of the TTC to the province and the construction of new lines and subway extensions, our government is doing just that. Despite this, Premier, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his Liberal government have chosen to play politics with infrastructure that people desperately need. Mr. Speaker, for the first time ever, the province is taking a true leadership role in building new transit. Could the minister tell us about how our government is doing to help commercial in this province. Thank you. The questions to the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you uh, very much, and, and thank you to the member for that excellent question this morning. 
Mr. Speaker, we're putting people at the centre of everything that we do. That means helping commuters and providing relief for uh, people in the GTA through five great transit projects. Prime Minister Trudeau claims that we haven't done our part to get infrastructure built. Well, Mr. Speaker, Justin Trudeau is dead wrong. We've nominated 54 road, bridge and transit projects to the federal government, and Justin Trudeau has yet to approve a single project. The Prime Minister is worried about election season. We're worried Order. about the construction season. Mr. Speaker, the federal government didn't waste any time approving transit projects in Vancouver. They approved Vancouver's projects before a business case was even submitted. Yet, Justin Trudeau Response. prefers to play politics. His government is not putting the people of Ontario first. We've submitted these projects to the federal government. I'm calling on Justin Trudeau to put his money where his mouth is. Fund our projects. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the Minister of Infrastructure for the great response. The Premier made a historical announcement just a couple months ago. Our government for the people announced a 28.5 billion subway plan that will get the commuters of this province moving. Those commuters use Line 1 on a daily basis, know the congestion that exactly exists. We've heard from people loud and clear that they're tired of overcrowd on subways. So we are building the new Ontario line, both for Toronto residents and people coming into the city. However, as the minister has stated, we are calling on the federal government to give their support to the historical subway plan. Can the Minister of Infrastructure share more about the funding commitment made from the Federal Before Government. Justin Thank you. Questions to the Minister of Infrastructure. I'll refer this question to our amazing Minister of He's Transportation. He's referring it to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for that question. Opposite, uh, let me inform the Chamber that uh, we have a plan. We have four projects that we need to get rolling. Mr. Speaker, we have been speaking with the Federal Government, and now it's time for them to act. We are not asking for favours. We're not asking for special treatment. We are, in fact, asking for the same treatment that the federal government under Justin Trudeau has given other provinces. And right now, we are not being treated the same. That's why the Minister of Infrastructure and I called on Justin Trudeau to publicly stop campaigning and play in games with this funding. Opposition we are ready order. to build transit, Mr. Speaker. We have money committed to building it. We have legislation Opposition that allows us to, to build order. it faster and cheaper. Response. We have taken decisive action to get transit built for Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. It's time for Justin Trudeau to do his job and fund and build transit. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, since 2008, residents in North Chatham Kent have been dealing with well water contaminated by black shale, a known carcinogen. This contamination is attributed to the pile driving of foundations through the bedrock of the North Kent One wind turbine project. Speaker, during the campaign, the current Premier Order. promised the people affected by this contamination that he would conduct a health hazard investigation immediately. Well, Speaker, immediately has come and gone. It's now more than a year later, and the people are still waiting. They're here in the gallery today, and they have lost trust in this Premier and this government. Will the minister stand up today and make good on his promise to ensure these Ontarians have clean and safe drinking water? I'm calling on the minister to put his money where his mouth is and initiate this health hazard investigation today for these people that have been here and fighting for years for clean drinking water. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will come to order. The questions to the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you uh, very much, and I thank the member uh, of Essex for the heads up. 
uh, for this question here this morning, and we welcome uh, those uh, members and even the former members from uh, 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 the community in, in Chatham Kent who have fought uh, for this issue. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've been working uh, very, very hard uh, on this issue. I've been working closely with uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, and we're looking forward to having uh, more to say. Uh, but, you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is quite ironic. Uh, this member, the party opposite, the opposition party, voted in favour of the Green Energy Act, uh, Mr. Order. Speaker. They voted in front uh, in favour of the Samsung Agreement, Mr. Speaker. They supported private power when they voted for that Green Energy Act. Response. Mr. Speaker, we were left with a mess. We are going to clean it up. They caused this problem. We'll take no advice from that member. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. The government side will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Essex. Speaker, the minister knows that he's dodging the question. I know that he's dodging the question. And more importantly, his own community knows that he's dodging the question, Speaker. Speaker. This is about priorities, and you know what I find ironic? This is a government that prioritizes access to beer over access to clean drinking water for the member for his own riding. It's unbelievable. I want to talk about irony. Speaker, in a letter to Kevin Jakubik of Waterwells First, the Premier wrote the following, quote, I commit myself and the PC Party of Ontario to stopping this travesty and commit that a full health, in health invest investigation is conducted in North Chatham-Kent. As Premier, you have my word, Kevin. We will hold accountable every party that did this. Premier and Minister, will you honour your word, or should we just chalk this one up as another empty promise from the Premier and his ministers? Members, please take their seats. The question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Order. this member supported that. Stop the clock. The member for Essex will come to order. The Premier will come to order. Restart the clock. The Minister of Infrastructure has the floor and can reply. Speaker, we are honour our commitment. Uh, we've made uh, all kinds of promises, and we're fulfilling every single we're fulfilling every Order. single promise uh, that we uh, made in that campaign. And Mr. Speaker, we came to government. We immediately cancelled 758 wind and solar contracts. You oppose that, sir, Mr. Speaker. We cancelled the Green Energy Act that that party opposite supported. You voted against that. And I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, we are the only. Those parties accountable. Okay, the, the Minister of Infrastructure take a seat. Stop the, clock. the member for Essex will come to order. The member for Waterloo will come to order. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, come to order. Anybody else? Start the clock. The next question, the member for Brampton South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Everyone knows that our government speaks the language of the people. And today, as all of Ontario awaits the tip off of Game 3 of the NBA Finals, we are talking Raptors. My question is to the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, millions of Ontarians have turned in to watch, tuned in to watch Kyle Lowry, Kawhi Leonard, Pascal Siakam, and their teammates chase the championship for the North. We the North. From the comfort of their homes to our multiplying Jurassic parks, Ontarians are taking note of the brand new chance to participate in games 50-50 draws online from anywhere in the province. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General 
please tell this House about this government's support for charities and the important Question. changes that have allowed charities like the MLSC Foundation to open up their 50-50 raffles, raffles online. The question is to the Attorney General. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's go Raptors. Yay! Mr. Speaker, to make life easier for charities and the people who support them, my parliamentary assistant, the member for Durham, on behalf of my ministry, announced changes earlier this year that have made it possible to fundraise through online 50-50 draws. Now you don't need to be in the building for the big game to grab a chance to win the big prize through a seamless online experience. Opposition, While we're come all to order. confident about the Raptors' chances tonight in Oakland, we know that the charities and the people and the communities they support are already winning. I have had the chance to develop and grow a charity with my family and, the ex and experience the profound impact we can each have when, it when we come together as communities Response. to create positive change. Mr. Speaker, it's been incredible to see the funds raised this spring for charitable initiatives by organizations like the MLSC Foundation, Jay's Care, the Ottawa Senators Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Attorney General for her response. Of course, we know that the Ottawa Senators Foundation, Jay's Care Foundation, and other foundations and charities like Hospital Foundation are among so many important charities that will help so many people across this province. For example, the MLSE Launchpad has helped 13,000 young people through free sports programming since it opened its doors in 2017. They have an additional 6,000 kids currently enrolled. We look forward to Jay's Care's next Challenger Baseball National Jamboree and the girls' at-bat All-Star Game. Now, we all know that in baseball and basketball, the numbers tell their own story. And since the member from Durham made this announcement, we have noticed a significant increase in the impact these, this, these new changes have had to foundations. Could the Attorney General please share some of these numbers to illustrate the impact of allowing online e-raffles in Ontario across this province? Thank you. The Attorney General to reply once again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The power of the online platform for charitable 50-50 draws is truly remarkable, and the member is right. Since the member from Durham made the announcement, the numbers that have been generated this spring are also truly remarkable. For Game 2 of the NBA Final, more than $490,000 in 50-50 dollars uh, were raised. One game alone, Mr. Speaker. 87 percent of the sales, 978,000 in sales, took place online. In total, the MLSE Foundation has raised over $1.5 million for the MLSE Foundation initiatives at Maple Leafs and Raptors games. Meanwhile, the Toronto Blue Jays Care Foundation nearly doubled its 50-50 sales through its opening four-game series this season compared to last year. In total, more than $977,000 in total 50-50 tickets were sold over those four games, Response. which helps empower, uh, to help fund initiatives like the Challenger Program, which empowers children, youth and adults living with physical and cognitive disabilities with poor life skills inherent to baseball. Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. The question is for the acting premier. The Hamilton Spectator last week had a front page story about my private member's bill, the Nancy Rose Act, and I'm grateful to have had all party support in passing the bill. My sister Nancy died of leukemia as a child. Directly next to that story about my bill was a report about leukemia rates in Hamilton. This study found that in some Hamilton neighbours, the leukemia rates are double the national average. Sarnia, Thunder Bay, St. Catharines, Sault Ste. Marie, and Hamilton are those five communities. Benzene exposure from industry is identified as having links to specific types of cancer, including acute myeloid leukemia. Mr. Speaker, this government has repealed the Toxic Substance Act. Facilities no longer need to prepare new toxic substance reduction plans or even to review existing plans. My question is, does this government think tracking and reducing toxic substances are important? And what do they have to say to those residents who are being exposed to health risks with little to no government accountability or oversight? Site. The question is addressed to the Premier. Minister of Environment. 
Refer to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, and uh, and again we all commend her on her uh, on her private members' bill. Mr. Speaker, these are issues that this government is taking extremely seriously. Mr. Speaker, that is why, after years and years of promises that communities like Sarnia would receive a health study, promises made by the previous government, Mr. Speaker, this government, because because Mr. Speaker of the hard work of our MPP from Sarnia, and I'm, I, Bob Bailey, I know I'm not supposed to say their names, Mr. Speaker. But he came to me as the Minister of Environment on day one and said, you need to come to Sarnia. You need to hear the promises that have been made about a health study that hasn't been kept. That's why this government, Mr. Speaker, is investing in those kinds of studies. So we are doing the work that previous governments didn't do. We take these studies very seriously, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're focused on clean air, clean air. Thank you very much. Once again, I wish to remind members that after we conclude our business this morning, we're going to come together in this 42nd Parliament across party lines and have our photograph taken, the official photograph of the 42nd Parliament, so I'm hopeful that everyone's able to stay. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Scarborough Guildwood has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Finance concerning government priorities. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. Now we have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 115, an act to amend the Liquor Control Act with respect to the termination of a specified agreement. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
I'm going to ask the members to please take their seats. On May 30th, 2019, Mr. Fidelli moved second reading of Bill 115. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethlenfalvy. Mr. Bethlenfalvy. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Mr. Yur. Mr. Yur. Ms. Maroney. Ms. Maroney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalanga. Mr. Kalanga. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Trantopolopoulos. Ms. Trantopolopoulos. Mr. Sicaria. Mr. Sicaria. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carr Holly. Mrs. Carr Holly. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Mr. Bowman. Mr. Bowman. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canna. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Pay. Mr. Pay. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Yermonta. Ms. Yermonta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Mr. Creek. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Borgwan. Mr. Borgwan. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Harder. Mr. Harder. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Madame de Rossi. Madame de Rossi. Mademoiselle Simard. Mademoiselle Simard. The ayes are 70, the nays are 48. The ayes being 70 and the nays being 48. I declare the motion carried. <laughs> Pursuant to the order of the House, dated June the 4th, 2019, the bill is ordered for a third reading. There being no further business this morning other than the photograph, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.